It is true that the entire world, head for head, needs to be reconciled to God because the entire world is guilty before God and has trespasses before God. But it is equally true from Scripture that not all men, head for head, are actually reconciled to God. Remember, reconciliation is by definition here the non-imputation of trespasses. And there are many, many in the world to whom God indeed does impute trespasses. Many live and will die with their trespasses imputed to them. And they will therefore suffer the guilt and the punishment of those trespasses which God imputes to them. And therefore, in no sense of the word can you say that someone who perishes in hell has been reconciled to God. God never forgives their sins. God never embraces them as friends. God always and forever and ever will treat them as his enemies. <coughs> and since this is true, the word world here in verse 19 cannot mean every single member of the human race. But refers to the elect within the human race who are actually reconciled to God. And the Corinthians would have understood this. Remember the Corinthians were outright pagans, not Jews. They understood that the word world is used in distinction from the Jewish nation which was the object of God's favour in the Old Testament. That distinction was clear to the pagans in Corinth. Alas, it is not clear to many in the church world today. Remember, it does not say God was in Christ trying to reconcile as many people in the world as possible to himself and offering not to impute their trespasses onto them. There's no potentiality here. There's no condition here. If God is reconciling the world unto himself, he is not imputing the world's <coughs> trespasses onto them. And so we have several possibilities, of which there only is one correct possibility here, of what the world means. Either world here means the entire human race, and all without exception, are actually reconciled to God. And God does not impute anyone's trespasses onto them. Which means that every single person in the history of the world was saved and has gone to heaven and will go to heaven and hell at the end will be empty. But of course we know from the rest of scripture that such an interpretation cannot be correct. Or world does mean the entire human race without exception. But reconciliation does not actually mean the non-imputation of trespasses. But that goes against the actual text itself and overthrows the entire gospel of reconciliation. Or the text means this, and this is the correct view, that God does not impute the world's trespasses onto them, that is to say, God does not impute the trespasses of the elect who are gathered from every nation, tribe, and tongue, and that is the world meant in the text. That's the only correct view of this verse. And this reconciliation, this non-imputation of trespasses, was accomplished by the triune God in and through and by Jesus Christ. Verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself, 
by Jesus Christ. Verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. When Paul writes here that the world's trespasses are not imputed unto them, he is saying that the world's trespasses are imputed to someone else. God does not simply ignore the world's trespasses as if they never happened. He imputes them to his Son, Jesus Christ. His son suffered for the world's trespasses. God reckoned the trespasses of the world which he reconciled to himself to the account of Jesus Christ so that Jesus Christ became legally responsible for these trespasses. He laid them to the charge of Jesus Christ and the whole weight of the law fell on the shoulders of Jesus Christ in order for God to treat us as his beloved friends. He treated his own beloved son as if he were his arch enemy. All of our trespasses were laid to his account and he was punished accordingly. And in this way he fulfilled the law. The law said, entire, lifelong, perfect, complete obedience is God's requirement. And no man can or will obey that law. The law says you must pay for every violation of God's law. And no man is able to bear that punishment or even to begin to pay off that debt, but Christ was, and Christ did. Christ kept the law perfectly, and Christ suffered all of the punishment which we deserve for our violation of that law. And this imputation of our trespasses to Christ was necessary because Christ had to die. It would not have been enough for God simply to send us messages from heaven declaring to us how much he loves us. That would not have brought about reconciliation. It was not enough for Christ even to come down into our flesh and to live among us for a while and to teach us wonderful moral teachings as a moral teacher would and then go back up to heaven and live with the Father without dying for us, that would not have brought us reconciliation. If God, if Christ had not died and bore the sin which we deserve to bear, God's wrath would still be upon us, we would still be his enemies, and we could never be his friends, we would die in rebellion against him. <coughs> but how can the sinless Son of God die? How can it be legal that he should die? He must stand before God with the legal status of a lawbreaker and a sinner. But Christ never personally sinned. And Christ had no sinful nature. He had no original sin. He committed no actual sin his entire life. He was perfect in everything he thought and said and did. In no sense then did Christ deserve to die. But Christ then took upon himself the legal responsibility for the sins of all those whom he represented on the cross. And God then imputed to him our guilt. He laid to the charge of Christ our trespasses. And now Christ stands before God legally as one who deserves to die, as one who is legally guilty for all of the sins of God's elect from the very beginning of the world to the very end of the world, a number of sins which we cannot even begin to fathom. 